Well, good morning and welcome to South Point where we're one church in multiple locations. Good morning, Leonardtown Camp. Is anyone excited to be here this morning? See, this is why I love the second service. Like three people did that in the first service. Let's give a little fist bump to our Lesby campus, a little fist bump to our Lesby campus. We're so glad. And if you're watching online, we're so glad that you chose to join us here today at South Point. My name is Matt. I'm part of the team here today. Hey, we're closing up a series called Yes to Jesus and No to Religion. And kind of as we've gone through the series over the last several weeks, we've uncovered a principle that is true in life. And I'm gonna put it up on the screen. You already know it. I know it. It says this. It says, what makes a relationship great applies to both with God and people. Here's what we discovered the last couple of weeks is that what makes a regular relationship between people makes for a great relationship with God. The principles that apply in our relationships that make them work, make them healthy and make them good also apply to God. Here's what we discovered in week one. We discovered in week one, listen, all relationships have, what's that word? And here's why, listen, I was thinking about this um, as I was preparing. I, have a, I had a friend who was a state trooper, right? And I remember one time we were hanging out and he said, hey, I have to leave, I have to go right now. And I said, oh, sorry, what do you gotta do? And he says, I'm, I'm doing security, I'm doing some side work. And I go, oh, what for? And he goes, for a funeral. And I said, why do you need security for a funeral? Like it's, you know, I don't mean to be rude, but like it's already, already over. And is it like for a dignitary? And he's like, no, 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 no. It's just a normal funeral. And I go, well, that's really weird. And he goes, no, no, no. Listen, have you ever met families? And I went, yes. He goes, that's why. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, at weddings and at funerals, they include alcohol and then all the hurt boils to the top and people, people get great, crazy. And here's what we know. The reason that there's drama on Facebook, the reason there's, there's fights in families, the reason that we all have these things is because all relationships have... We all know that. We have rules that we, the way we want to be treated, we want to treat other people. All relationships have true uh, rules. And here's what we discovered in week one is that we need to honor God, we need to surrender, and that there are boundaries. And it applies to our regular relationships, and it also applies to our relationship with God. And then in week two, we discovered this truth also. Without genuine connection on a regular basis, what's that word? All, all relationships grow apart. Listen, without genuine connection on a regular basis, our relationships grow apart and it is no different with God. And so we answered the question, how do we genuinely connect to a God that we can't see or we can't touch? And we said, listen, we can genuinely connect to God through the Bible. We can genuinely connect to God through people, his church. We can genuinely connect to God through creation. And we can genuinely connect to God through prayer. Those are some of the ways that you and I can genuinely connect so that we don't grow apart from God. And so that's kind of a recap. If you missed any of those, you can go to our YouTube channel, you can go to our website, and you can catch up. Today, I want to talk about a principle. Listen, you already know this principle. Listen, not only do you already know this principle, you've already experienced this principle. And not only have you know it, not only have you experienced this principle, is simple. Like, it's so simple, but very hard to do. Matter of fact, when I think about this principle, and even when I talk about this principle, if I'm very honest, it reminds me of some of my most shameful, embarrassing moments in life. Listen, listen, I grew up, I already know I'm a knucklehead. I already know I have faults. But whenever I talk about this principle, it reminds and uncovers something in me that I really don't want to admit there. And so I'm going to kind of describe this principle, but I want to share you a story because I think in the story, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, when I was younger, um, I, I was in the juvenile justice system. Uh, I got out, I got sent to a foster home, and I went to a church lot like this. And there was this guy, he had a family in the church, and he saw that like I was somewhat familyless. I was in this foster home, and he invited me over for Thanksgiving, my first Thanksgiving outside of juvie. The, this guy, he had a wonderful family. I don't know why he invited me over, but he had four beautiful daughters, and he was part of the church, and he saw me need and said, hey, you don't have any place to go for Thanksgiving. Why don't you come to my house for Thanksgiving? I said, thank you. And I ate lots of delicious food. I became friends with the family. After I graduated high school, um, I didn't really have a job. And he says, why, he owned a business. He says, why don't you come work for me? I'll get you a job and I'll get you started. And that went great. And so I really appreciated the job. He would have me over for Thanksgiving and Christmas and gave me a job. Um, and then I wrecked my car. And so I didn't have a car. I didn't have a way to get to, the, to this job that my friend had given me. And so he said, listen, I tell you what, I'll, I'll let you move in with us temporarily. So he let me come and stay with his family. Like he let me move into his house and stay there. And so he gave me a roof over my head. He gave me a job. He let me hang out with the family. Um, and then one day he surprised me. He gave me a car. Like, does anybody want to know this person? Because I mean, that's pretty cool, right? Like invited me in his home, gave me a job, got me a car, right? And like, it was just, it was really cool. Um, and then a little bit later, um, this family that I was staying with, um, they needed to move. And I can remember it was about Thursday um, that he said, hey, Matt, by the way, we're moving this weekend. I need to make sure that you got a clear schedule and you're ready to help us move. And I said, oh, I can't do that. Uh, I got some plans for the weekend. And he about, he about ripped me apart with his bare hands. 
And rightfully so, he should have given me a good old fashioned, you know, kick in the tail. But he cussed me up and down. And he says, I can't believe you. You're gonna tell me like, I put a roof over your head. I gave you a job. I bought you a car and y you can't make time to come help me. Like you just need to never show up in my life again if that's, if that's how you're gonna treat me. Um, and I'm really embarrassed because it really identifies just how selfish I can be, right? I, I'm just how selfish I can be. And see, in that experience, here's what I discovered. That if you're in a significant relationship or you have a relationship and you let selfishness win, it'll end up destroying the relationship. Matter of fact, you've probably experienced this either on a personal level or you've been me, right? I mean, we've all probably experienced selfishness. And it leads us to a truth, again, the truth that embarrasses me. And it's a truth that you've already experienced. And I want to put it like this. It says this, significant relationships that lose the tug of war with selfishness don't work. And here's why significant relationships that lose the tug of war of selfishness don't work is because, listen, those that you're in significant relationship with believe and know that there should be like a not a win-lose situation, that it should be a win-win situation. And here's what people that you're in significant relationship with will begin to see. Just because you say something, just because you believe something, just because you pretend something, if your actions don't match what you say, and believe it will harm the relationship. When we let selfishness, when we lose the tug of war in significant relationships, it doesn't work. And here's why it doesn't work. You already know this, I already know this. It's what makes significant relationships significant. And it's this truth up here, which is, and it's coming, I promise. Significant relationships cause us to say yes to their wants and while saying, to our wants. Did you see, I'm like, no one died. Good. You guys smile. Come on, everyone smile. I'm like, I, no one likes to say this. I, no one at the first service liked it either. Matter of fact, no one at the first service liked the rest of my message from here on out. So you can just buckle up and I'm just going to have fun because I already know you're not going to like what I'm going to say. But listen, significant relationship caused us to say yes to their wants while saying no to our wants. Listen, listen, listen. You already know this. Come on. I got any parents in the house? Got any parents in the house? All right, parents. How much PJ Mask have you watched lately because you're a parent, right? Like, you don't want to watch PJ Mask. Listen, listen, when you're a parent, you'll watch, I watch Disney movies, Princess Disney's movies, tons of them, because my little girls want to do it. I saw a little girl, she came to the first service, she was so cute, she came in with a little skirt, and she had a shirt, and had a little Ariel, and I still remember Ariel, because I watched Ariel so many times, go, ah, right? You think I wanted to watch Ariel sing, ah, like 50 million times? No, but listen, significant relationship causes us to say yes to, while saying, to our wants. Like I wanted to watch like, you know, like, you know, the Terminator or something, you know, with my three-year-old kid. No, I'm just joking. But like, like I said yes to them and no to myself. I mean, think about this. Like, like ladies, like ladies, I know you put up with us guys. Like how many ladies here on a dating relationship or a marriage, you watched a boring, unrealistic, no plot, explosion, shoot 'em ups action scene movie that had no plot. It was horrible. You don't even know why you went to it, but you went to it because your, your, you know, your boyfriend or your husband wanted to watch it. And so you said, Yes to and no to what you wanted because you wanted to see the romantic comedy that actually had a decent plot. But like you said yes to this because cause you cared about him. It was significant. You said this. Listen to this. How many of you have ever been in a car, a car with a, like a really good friend, your BFF, you're hanging out, and a song comes on the radio and you hate the song. You hate the singer. You hate the song, right? But your friend, your friend, they love it. They start singing it all aloud and you're like, you want to turn it off and smack them. How dare you like that song, right? But, but you don't do it because you want to let them enjoy because it's their favorite song. So you say... Okay, I'm not tricking you. Yes to their wants while saying no to our wants. I want to turn it off, but you say yes because they're your best friend. How many of y'all got a grandma or a ma? All of you do, by the way, just in case you're wondering. All of y'all got a grandma. All of y'all got a mom. How many of them have ever called you up to ask you to do something boring? Do you want to go to a knitting conference with me? No, I'd rather die, right? Do I want to go to a knitting conference? No, right? And so, but you say yes to their wants because of the significant relationship while saying to what you want, because we all know. You didn't need to come to church today. You already knew it. Significant relationships cause us to say yes to their wants while saying no to our wants. That's what makes a significant relationship. It's the difference. When you go out on the street and someone says, will you do this for me? You go, I don't know you, no. Right? You don't have a relationship with them. You know, you may have an acquaintance or somebody that you kind of know. And if they ask you something, you go, no, like, I don't know you. Like, we're not like tight. We're not like, friends. like, the answer is no. 
But when like a brother or sister or a mom or a dad or, or a husband or a wife or, or somebody that's your best friend, when they ask you something because the relationship is significant, you will say yes to what they want and no to what you want because that is a significant relationship. And here's what we discover. When we say are in insignificant relationships and we surrender what we want for what they want, it creates life change. I mean, matter of fact, this is kind of the truth. This is kind of the principle about all relationships apply. We're gonna put it up on the screen. And if you're following on the insert, it's the box when it says, significant relationships change how we relate to the world around us. Significant relationships change how we relate to the world around us. If you don't believe me, ask a married person. Right? Just, if, if you don't think significant relationships change how you relate to the world, ask a married person. Ask a parent who has a brand new baby. They relate to the world all differently now that they got a brand new, like, like listen, significant relationships change how we relate to the world. And I bet every single person in this room or watching can think of a significant relationship that changes the way we see the world, that changes the way we think about the world and changes the way we act in the world. I bet all of us can think of significant relationships that cause us to do those, that act actually changes how we relate to the world around us. And here's what's amazing about the simple thing that we already know. Jesus, this is, what, this is why I woke up early. This is why I love God, Jesus, Bible. Moses. Listen, this is what Jesus tells us. Jesus is like, listen, this is what I'm coming to tell people, that if you have a significant relationship with God, it should it should change how you relate to the world. Matter of fact, Jesus, that's all he does. He goes to a group of people and says, if you say you have a relationship with God, it should change how you relate to the world around us. Anyone that is in a significant relationship with God, it will change how they think, it will change how they see things, and it will change how they act. It will change how they act. Because the reality is, is significant relationships, that's what they do. And if selfishness wins the tug of war, then the significant relationship doesn't work and it usually ends poorly. Now, Jesus had this encounter with someone who thought they had a significant relationship with God. And Jesus was talking about the very issue that we're talking about today. And so today, instead of you know, hearing about what I have to say, we should take a look at what Jesus has to say. And, and Jesus has this encounter. We're going to put it up on the screen. It's in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Mark. Someone wrote this down. Uh, Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus always had a posse. People loved to see Jesus. Jesus was amazing. I think if church people got a hold that it's all about Jesus and not about the other stuff, people would still be attracted to him. Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem. And a man came running up to him and he knelt down and he asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus is walking around. He's going to Jerusalem. This young guy comes running up and Jesus is like, whoa, 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 you know, like, and then the, the young man comes and kneels down and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I want to be really clear because if you, if you, maybe if you have no church background, maybe you have a different faith background, or maybe you grew up in church, the word eternal life is kind of weird because I think most church people think eternal life is kind of like a length of life, but that's not when you read in the Bible, eternal life isn't length of life. It's not just about living forever. Eternal life is the kind of life that is worth living forever. When he asked this question to Jesus, he's asking the question, Jesus, what kind of life is deserving and worthy to live forever? It's not just length of life, it's Jesus, what is the kind of life that is worth living for in eternity? Now, Jesus' answer shocked him, it shocked the audience, and it will shock us. Here's Jesus' answers. Why do you call me good? I mean, the guy just gave Jesus a compliment. He just fell down at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus is like, why do you call me good? Jesus asked, only God is truly good. I mean, only God is truly good. And in this moment, we're kind of confused because it seems like he's a little bit upset. But Jesus is doing something important in that moment, and he's doing something important for the rest of eternity as we read his words. And this is so important. You see, here's what we discovered. If you call Jesus a good teacher, then a good teacher is someone who gives you advice that you can choose to take or not take. If Jesus is just a good man, if Jesus is just a guru, then we can just go, well, I'll take that, but not take that. I get to choose what it is that I want to believe and follow of what he says. But Jesus wants to identify, he says, no, only God is really truly good. And Jesus wants you and I to know that the empty tomb, that the apostle Paul who was persecuting the church, who encountered a risen Jesus, lets us know that Jesus wasn't a guru, Jesus wasn't a good teacher, Jesus is God. 
And he's confronting the, the young rich ruler to go, I'm not good where you get to say yes or no. I'm God. And when it comes to God, God doesn't give suggestions. He gives commands. And so before he even answers the question, he wants to settle something in people's hearts. If you're going to listen to what I'm going to say, and it's going to be just as a teacher, then why are you even asking? Because if you hear something you don't want to, you'll just ignore it. But if I'm God, then you should obey what it is I'm about to say. And I love Jesus because he loves the guy. Jesus is gracious. And here's what he does. We're going to put it up on the screen. Jesus says, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. Pr pretty good commandment, right? For eternal life, you don't want to murder for living forever because then a murderer just might murder again, right? You must not commit adultery. Not going to even go there, right? You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. You must honor your father and mother. So Jesus gives them six of the 10 commandments and says, listen, if you want to have the kind of life that's worth living forever. If you want to see the kind of life that is worthy and deserving and leads to life everlasting, these are the six of the things that you should do. But now here's what's amazing about what Jesus does when he gives them these six commands. He leaves out four. See, these six commands all have to do with how we relate to people. Jesus leaves out the four about relating to God. So Jesus says, listen, you want the kind of life that is eternal, that's worth living forever? Do these things. To which the young man replies, and we see this, he says, teacher, now he doesn't call him good or God, he just, he doesn't know what to do, he's confused. Teacher, <laughs> the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments. And he said, listen, Jesus, I've been a good person. I went to Sunday school, I got a job, I went to, I went to and got my education, I don't cheat people, I'm, you know, I'm married to the same person I met. Like, Jesus, I'm a good, I'm good, I do this, you know, I do those things. To which Jesus replies, and this is beautiful, I love this. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Now, I just want to stop here. Jesus genuinely loves you. Not because you obey, but because he's good and he's God. And you have inherent value. Regardless of the choices that you make, every person in this room has inherent value. And he loved you so much that he was willing to die on a cross and pay my penalty, your penalty, and our penalty. So whenever Jesus tells us something, he always tells us in love. And here's what I've discovered about love. Here's what I've discovered about true friends. Here's what I've discovered about people that genuinely love other people. They are willing to tell you the truth whether you want to hear it or not. Because people that love you care about it being good for you whether you like them or not. So Jesus looked at him in love and said, there's still one thing that you haven't done. He told them, hey guy, there's one thing you haven't done. You did all those things, great. There's just, you're just missing one thing and then you get eternal life. To which I go, what is this, Jesus? What is it? And the guys were like, what is it, Jesus? What's this one thing? Which shocks me because Jesus actually, like, I don't understand this. Like Jesus created the universe. He created math. Like this doesn't seem like right math. Jesus says, go and sell all your possessions, one, and give the money to the poor, two, and then you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me, three. See, Jesus says, listen, you need to do this one thing, but then Jesus tells them three things to do. I'm confused. Like, I'm not the smartest guy, but like, I understand the difference between one and three. Jesus says, there's one thing you need to do, but then gives him three things that he's supposed to do. Go sell your possessions, give them the boar, and then come follow me. And it looks like in the immediate that maybe Jesus doesn't understand math, but when we kind of see the young rich ruler's response, we see that it is actually just one thing. The young rich ruler responds, at this, the man's face fell, which means he was sad disappointed, shocked, and he went away sad for he had many possessions. The young rich ruler came to Jesus and he says, oh, I got a significant, I mean, me, and, me and God, we're tight. We got a significant relationship. And then when Jesus asked him to say, is God really number one in your life? Is God the most significant relationship? The young rich man realizes that the four commandments that talk about your relationship with God, that God was not number one, that his most significant relationship was with money and not with God. And here's something that you can take to the bank. You can read the news, you can watch the news, you can go on the internet and you'll see this truth. Anytime human beings put something other than God first, we live flawed and broken lives. We see flawed, we think flawed, and we act flawed. And see, all Jesus wanted to do with this, with this young rich ruler was, listen, you relate to the world through your wealth. 
Jesus looked at the young rich woman and says, you're almost there. Your, your greatest relationship is with money, so you relate to the world through your money. The problem is money isn't God. And if you relate to the world around you through your money, you will think wrongly, you'll see wrongly, and you'll act wrongly. He says, but no, 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 just flip it. If you put God first, then you'll see correctly, you'll think correctly, and you'll act correctly. But the young rich ruler walked away, unwilling to surrender what he wanted for what Jesus wanted. And when you don't surrender what you want for what someone else wants in a significant relationship, then maybe it isn't as significant as we think it is. And I know whenever you use the word surrender, people get all like freaked out. No, 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 I'm gonna win. But here's what I know. Anytime God asks us to surrender, it's always best for us. It always protects us. It always keeps us. It is always what is best for us when we surrender what it is God wants for us. And so many of us in this room, I wonder if you showed up today going, I think I have a significant relationship with God. And so I want to challenge not just you, but I want to challenge myself. I want to challenge all of us, those who are watching, those that are here. Does our relationship with God actually create life change? Is there any change in our lives that people can see? Because a significant relationship with God should change three things. And listen, I'm gonna tell you something, you're not gonna like any of these to start with. Like the people at the first service, they look like, man, can you just be done? I don't like what you're saying. I didn't like what I was saying. But we're gonna talk about this. And the first, a significant relationship with God, here's the first thing that should change. A relationship with God changes how we relate to people. I mean, if you have a significant relationship with God, it should change the way that you relate to people. Matter of fact, this, this isn't my idea. This is, this is what Jesus says. Let's, let's look, look at the words of Jesus. We're going to put it up on the screen. And the, I was the account of the Gospel of John. This is what Jesus says. Jesus says, how can you believe? What he's saying is, how can you think that you have a significant relationship with God? How can you think that God is number one in your life? How can you think you're connected to God if you accept glory from other people? Or are you looking for other people to value that you? If you're looking for acceptance from others, but do not seek the glory or acceptance that comes only from God. Jesus is confused. He's like, how can you say God is your most significant relationship when yet you would rather make other people smile than God smile? At some point, if you're willing to make other people smile instead of making God smile, he's not your most significant relationship. And listen, I get in a room this size, there might be people with no faith. They said, hey, there's a funny looking dude with big ears. You should come see him, maybe you're here. Maybe you have a different faith. You heard we had a hot band and donuts. And so you came and you may be going, well, why does this matter to me? And some of you may have grown up in church, but here's why here's I, I think this is, Jesus tells us because this is so and so important. Listen, here's why this is so important. When you and I prefer to get acceptance from people over God, we will always have flawed thinking We'll always have flawed seeing and we'll always have flawed actions. You wanna know why? People are imperfect. Shocking, right? Here, I got news. All people are flawed. All of them. Me, you, all of us. We're all imperfect, we're all flawed. The moment that you and I put someone ahead to make them smile ahead of God, we will not see correctly, we will not think correctly, and we will not act correctly because they are flawed and imperfect. Listen, listen, listen. I know that your kid is cute and adorable and as parents, you should absolutely love your kids. You should be a good parent. But the moment you put your kid ahead of God, you have put a flawed, imperfect thing. And if you don't believe me, just go to pre-K, you'll see. You're putting a flawed, imperfect being ahead of God, which will then impact how you think and how you see and how you act. Listen, your spouse, if you're married, should be the second most important relationship outside of Christ. They absolutely should have a significant place in your life. But I am telling you, if you're putting your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, or your wife, and you want to make them smile more than you want to make God smile, they are flawed. I, I know some of you married really great. You all are beautiful and wonderful and you're smart. Hooray. Bo, you're imperfect. We're flawed. And as soon as you put your spouse on a pedestal ahead of God, you will not think, see, and act correctly because the only one that is imperfect is God. Listen, maybe you got a mama. Maybe you got a best friend. And you always want to make them smile instead of making God smile. They are flawed and they are imperfect. At some point, the person we choose to make smile in life should be God. I discovered early on, 
I really am a moron. I'm, I, I am surprised that I've uh, made it this far in life. Um, I, true story, and again, I'm gonna, I tell all embarrassing stories, so if you feel like guilty or shame, don't, because I mess it up more than anyone, so just welcome to the club, right? Like, I remember this is a true story, um, and kind of talks about, like, if you value a relationship, um, then, then, then you want to make them smile. I remember one time, I, you know, I love to talk, as you can tell, right? And I was with a group of people, um, and we were telling stories, and I told a funny story about my wife. And so we got in the car, and then my wife said, hey, yeah, babe, don't tell funny stories about me. I go, but it was funny, and everyone liked me, and they laughed at my stories. And they go, I didn't laugh. And I went, ooh, okay. She goes, don't do it again. Yes, dear, won't do it again. Next time I was out with a group of friends, what do you think this moron did? Yeah, you all guess, right? I'll guess, right? Is I wanted to make everyone else smile. And then when I got in the car, guess who wasn't smiling? And I wonder how many of us want to make our friends and our coworkers and all these other people smile and think that we're cool or hip or whatever it is that we want to be at the cost of breaking God's heart. Because if you have a significant relationship with God, he should be the one we want to make smile first. See, I told you you guys would really like this. Okay, on to more. You're going to hate the next one. Okay, the next one's even worse. So we're just, they, they go progressively worse. So just prepare yourselves, right? A relationship with God changes how we relate to pleasure. A relationship with God changes how we relate to pleasure. Here's what adults understand. Listen, and adults aren't age, adults maturity. Listen, adults realize that you don't always do what feels good, that you do what is you do what's right, not always what feels good. Just because it feels good doesn't mean that you should do it. That adults or wise people realize that sometimes you say no to things because you're saying yes to something better. And this isn't my idea. This isn't my concept. We just see it straight from Scripture. Um, uh, in the letter of Titus, we see this, and we're going to put it up here on the screen. The Scripture is coming. It says, for the guilt. Oh, I got that wrong. Sorry. For the. Grace. Can we say that a little bit louder? For the. Grace. Listen, listen, I want everyone to look up here. God doesn't tell us to do stuff because he wants to guilt us into things. God tells us things because he loves us and because he wants what's best for us and because he wants to protect us. And God doesn't ask us to obey him out of guilt. He asks us to obey him out of grace and love for the grace of God that has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Man, if the church could just get a hold of those two words, grace and all. Grace, grace. No one gets to heaven because they earned it. We're all equal. Jesus paid the price. And all people are worthy of dignity and respect and have the opportunity to get to know Jesus. Can we just, like, if you want a different church, you should go somewhere. That's what we're about right there. So anyway, I'm just going to keep on going. It teaches us to say what? It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and world passions and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life in this present age. It is grace, not guilt. It is not shame. It is grace. It's when we realize that God loved you and I so much that he sent his son to die, to be whipped, to be nailed. To Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus said, listen, no one put me on the cross. I could call legions of angels. He willingly went on the cross. Obedience isn't about guilt or shame. It's about love. When you and I honor our marriage vows, it is not about following the rules, it's about loving your spouse. When you and I don't lie and cheat our friends, it's not about rules, it's about love and honoring your friends. Have you ever discovered that as we relate to people, it's not about the rules, it's about the relationship. And it is not legalism or shame or guilt, it is grace that moves you and I to say no. And listen, whenever it comes to kind of to our, our pleasures, listen, let's get, wait, wait, this is, we do big people church and little people church. Well, listen, when it comes to sex, when it comes to alcohol or food or drinking or lying or stealing or, or, uh, stealing or cheating or like any of all those things. And listen, someone, you know, in church people goes, well, it's those people. We, we are those people. Can we just all nod our head? We're, we're those people, right? Listen, they all feel good, but they come with devastating consequences. And see, when we choose not to believe this, we choose to believe something to be untrue. What it really comes down to is love and trust. We don't trust that God loves us enough to tell us what's good for us. Right? I mean, we don't obey God. Here's what we're saying. I don't think I'm going to get what it is I want, God. I think you're going to hold out on me. I think you're, you're not trustworthy. So I'm going to do what I want so I can get what I want because I know you won't give it to me. And so I'm going to go get it for myself. 
And it always comes down, do we trust that God will meet our needs at the appropriate time in the appropriate way? I, I, I want to kind of share a little example. This, this is funny. It just happened, it just happened this, this week. It was in our office. How many of you have ever seen the, the game that came out about Christmas? It's called Bean Boozled. Anybody seen the game Bean Boozled? Okay, the same number of people the first service, like three. This isn't going to work really well. Okay, Bean Boozled, it's a funny, cute little game, but it's, it's a game that has jelly beans in it. Now, the funny thing, you'll be like, what is a game with jelly beans? Well, some of the jelly beans taste really good, but then the other half of the jelly beans taste like soap and rotten fish and dog food. Like they came up with like a list of things that taste really nasty. And the goal is, is that like everyone takes one and then it's like Russian roulette. You like, you're going, is it, this could be good. It could be bad. I don't know. And then you put it in your mouth. And what was hilarious is two little kids from the staff came in and one of the people in the staff, they were mean. They were like, do you want a jelly bean? <laughs> now they had played the game. So they knew what they were getting into, right? The kids knew what they were getting into. They're going, it might be good. It might be bad. See, when we won't surrender when it comes to pleasure, here's what happens. We take a jelly bean that looks like it's good, but when we taste it, it's horrible. Because see, there's pleasure in sin for a season, but then the bill comes due. And this is where Jesus is blatantly honest with all of us. Sin is destructive. It'll destroy your life and it'll destroy the lives of the ones around you and the ones that you love. God doesn't tell us to say no to keep us from fun. By the way, God created the whole world. He created, like, created sex. He created all the, like God created all that, by the way. That was his idea. So God's not against pleasure. God's against pleasure without boundaries because then we destroy ourselves. And if you don't believe me, just watch the news. Go on Facebook. Grace. If we really believe God loves us and gave his son for us, wouldn't we surrender what we want to make him smile? And I want to strongly encourage anyone here, and I'm going to just speak in general, but listen, if you're in a relationship with anyone that asks you to disobey God because they should love you, that's not fair or right. You should always honor God first. And if they really love you, they would never ask you to do something that dishonors God because that's true love. True love says, I care more about what you, what is right for you than what I'm getting out of the deal. Grace leads us to that. We can know and trust that God is good and is for us. Which leads us directly into the third part of the thing that changes. Again, this is going to get worse, right? A relationship with God changes how we relate to money. Church's favorite subject. You know what I get asked? Come on, come on, everyone smile. We're going to take a little break here. We're going to take a little bit of break here really quickly. You know what one of the number one questions I always get asked about South Point? Can you guess what it is? When are you going to build a, I get asked that all the time when I'm out and yeah, you got 50 acres, whenever you're going to build a building. And so I always respond with this question, what does it take to build a building? What is the least favorite subject to talk about in church? <laughs> so we're going to cover all of them today. So no one will like me. So it'll be just me tomorrow, next week by myself, talking to myself, right? But listen, a relationship with God changes how we relate to money. And then here's why. Here's why it changes the way that we relate to money. Money is kind of tricky, especially in our Western American cultures, because we, we, we think money is kind of like a savior, that money, if we just have enough of it, that, that we can control life around us. And you can ask wealthy people, money does not give you control of everything in life. Matter of fact, this is what the young rich ruler wanted to do. He wanted to be in control of his own life. He wanted money to be his provider, not God to be his provider. And when you and I put money or wealth first, we're asking money to be our provider and not God. And when you and I ask money to be our provider, it warps how we think, it warps how we see, and it warps how we act. See, money isn't evil. People go, oh, money's the root of all evil. No, 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 money isn't the root, money's neutral. It says the, the love of money is the root of all. It's greed. It's the desire to have control. It's the desire for you to be God or me to be God of my own life. But see, when we have a significant relationship with God, our relationship with money changes. We realize all of our stuff, our spouse, our kids, our money, our home cars, it's not ours. Because by the way, we're all going in the ground and you ain't taking it with you. Right? 
it really doesn't belong to us. We realize it all belongs to God and God has just made me a manager of this stuff so that I can bring up there, down here, so that I can live life, that I can make the world a better place, that I can honor him with all of my stuff. When you have a significant relationship with God, it changes how you relate to money. You don't go, it's all mine. You go, God gave it to me. God, how would you like me to use it? The reality is, is when money is our most significant relationship, here's what happens. Money is my provider and God becomes my tool. See, money is my provider to do what it is that I want, and God becomes the tool. He's the magic genie in the bottle that I come to on Sunday to ask me to bless me. Bless me and protect me. And the last time I checked, God is not a tool and he's not a genie in a bottle. It changes how we relate. Now, some of you might be asking, well, how do I know if, 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 you know, if money is more significant than God in my life? You know what? It's so simple, and you're not, you're going to hate this answer. You might even, like, just never come back. But if you really want to know uh, kind of where you stand on, like, it changing your relationship with money, if, if your relationship with God has changed it, just look at your checkbook. Do you give anything back to God? If you keep all of your stuff for you and you don't spend any of it on God, you have your answer. And that's not what I say. Listen, if you can get mad at hate, just go straight Jesus. You should be mad at Jesus, okay? Let me just put it up on the screen. Here's what Jesus says. Listen, Luke 16, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. See, here's the thing about number one relationships. You can only have one. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and? There can only be one number one. At some point, Either God will be our provider and we'll understand it all belongs to him and we're just managers or money will be our provider and God will just be our tool. But the last time I checked in significant relationship, nobody wants to be used as a tool. Which leads me to, if I was gonna sum up this whole message, I'm gonna put it up right here on the screen. It says this, a significant relationship is where surrender wins the tug of war with selflessness. You know this in your relationships and it's true of God. I want to ask you a really important question. Where have you surrendered? Because if you come here to church on Sunday and you say, I have a significant relationship with God, but I haven't surrendered by the way I treat people and deal with people, if I haven't surrendered on how I deal with and relate to pleasure, if I haven't surrendered how I deal with money, maybe our relationship with God isn't as significant as we think. True story. Again, I'm a moron, so I'm going to share an embarrassing story because just like you all, I need the grace of Jesus. And that's the great news is no matter how much of this we've messed up, there's forgiveness found in a person named Jesus. So I don't want anyone to walk here feeling shamed or guilted. It's grace. But uh, I look back on my first year of marriage. My wife and I, uh, coming into April, are going to be celebrating 25 years. I married a saint. If you know me, you know that to be true, right? I, I married a saint. And, um, and, and first year of marriage, I think, for, for, for me was like, first year of marriage, it was bliss. It was awesome. I think in the first year of marriage, my wife was amazing. And if I was really honest, if I looked everyone straight in the eye, I would say I was a poor husband the first year. Not that I, like, I overspent. Not that I was an alcohol. Not that I'd be like, I didn't do anything like wrong, wrong. I would just look you in the eye and go, my wife was an amazing wife and I was a poor husband. And you might be asking, well, Matt, if you didn't do anything that was you know, inherently wrong or bad, why would you say that you were a poor husband? Well, because I didn't really change. You see, my wife worked an hour away and it, was, it wasn't really, it was like a 20 minute drive, but in rush hour traffic with all the lights, it took an hour. And, and I worked um, a little bit of ways, um, but I had a pretty flexible schedule. And so she would drive an hour to work early in the morning. She would come home after an hour of rush hour traffic after working all day. Um, and many days I would, I can remember this, our first year of marriage, uh, because my job was flexible, I would go play golf in the afternoon. And never once did it occur to me that maybe I should not play golf all afternoon, maybe come home and help. Maybe I could start dinner. Maybe I, maybe I could like, be helpful. Like maybe I could do something. I didn't do that. I get home and go, man, it was hot out there playing golf. Can I have a, have a glass of tea? And some of you might be asking me, you're really bad. And I'm going, yes, I'm really selfish. Really didn't change the way I related to my wife based on the significance of a relationship that we had just, we had entered a marriage coming. And like, she was always very helpful. And I was always kind of like, hey, you know, my friends would say, hey, I want to go out. I'd be like, hey, babe, my friends want to go out. I'm going out. I never really said, hey, would you rather me spend time with you? And so I just went out and hung out with my friends. And I realized in my first year of marriage that I did not change the way I lived based on the significance of the relationship I just entered marriage. And what happens 
when selflessness wins the tug of war in a significant relationship. We all know what happens, right? Now here's the thing. My wife was my dream. She was the homecoming queen. I have no idea how I married her. Like when I think of, when I just think of the greatest person you could ever, I married, I, I won. I had the dream. All the romantic movies you see, that's me. I won the lottery. And yet I was about, I was sabotaging. I was, I was ruining the one thing that I wanted. My selflessness was ruining the dream because I was unwilling to surrender. Now, somewhere along the way, it was God's mercy. He hit me with a two by four. I don't know where I learned it, where I discovered it. I go, I am going to ruin this relationship if I don't change. And then I discovered something. Surrender means I win. See, for many of us in this room, we think we lose when we surrender. When we think when we give up what we want to do what God wants, we lose. When I gave up doing what I wanted to do, I didn't lose, I won. I saved my marriage. I learned how to become a better husband. We have a great life. And had I not been willing to surrender, I would have lost the very thing that I wanted. And many of you are here are seeking, you don't want religion. You want a relationship with the creator of the universe that speaks and steps into your life. But you'll never get it without surrender. And so I just have an important question. Have you surrendered? Because if you haven't surrendered, all we're left with is religion. And I don't think any of us want to sign up for that. Our hope and our prayer is that you, that I, that we would say yes to Jesus. Let me pray. Hey God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he was a truth teller that he loved us enough to tell us what we needed to hear, not what we wanted to hear. And thank you that when we didn't want to hear it and we went our own way, that Jesus was willing to go to the cross. And God, for any person within the sound of my voice or watching this video that feels guilt or shame, may they know that there is grace and mercy and forgiveness found in the gift of Jesus. That there's no sin that the blood of Jesus won't wash clean. But God, at some point, if we're going to have a friendship with you, Surrender is required. Because if we lose the tug of war with selfishness, it'll ruin our relationship. God, thank you for loving us. Help us to see you. Help us to surrender so we experience the kind of life that Jesus died for us to have. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.